Okay, good morning everybody. It's Sebastiano from Novavia speaking. Um, this is another Nova Talk and uh, today I have the pleasure, we have the pleasure to be with um, Mick Hughes from Australia. Um, so Mick, how are you doing? Hey Sebastiano, very good. How are you? Thanks for having me on your show. It's uh, exciting to be on here. I'm fine, thank you very much. So long story short, uh, Nova, Novavia decided to, in this weird period in which we are all uh, stuck at home uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 situation and the virus to produce and generate some contents, good quality quality content uh, that are free, freely available online. The idea mainly is to uh, produce content that are not strictly related to uh, clinical topics, but today is different. Today we're going to talk about ACL deficient knee uh, rehabilitation from I would say A to Z so from the trauma from the moment of the injury to uh, to the end of it to return to sport and you've asked me to come along and have a chat that's it it's very very nice of you I appreciate <laughs> the gesture yeah absolutely and the weird thing uh, funny stuff is that uh, you should have taken a plane you should have ca caught a plane today to reach us in Rome because uh, we had a course schedule with you in Rome in in a few days <laughs> right we should have then, been doing this in person, but nevertheless, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honoured to be on your show. So thanks for asking me to uh, yeah. yeah to be on. And it would be good to actually, you know, talk shop. We've, we've uh, conversed via email. You, you certainly have got a strong interest in ACL injuries. I've got one. So I think our forces combined should have a nice chat tonight. Yeah, let's hope so and see. Um, so let's go. Um, so big thing is, for example, uh, let's assume we have uh, an outlet or wh whoever that has an ACL injury. So we know there is an ACL complete there. And um, so what are the options? Uh, let's say if we would be in the US, I've been in the United States for a couple of years, it would be surgery right away. I mean, 99% of the ACL tears got surgery. Um, I get surgery, but we know literature, literature uh, scientific literature in our hands, but also our clinical experience, we can go another route. So um, yeah, yeah. what about the conservative approach? What what do you say about that? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I think that, to be honest, it's probably no different here in Australia as well. Um, the I think the default button to an ACL injury here in Australia is also reconstruction, particularly with a young male or female athlete. But there, there absolutely is, a, and, and I guess to put some numbers behind that, we're looking at about 90 to 95% of all ACL injuries here in Australia will, will be off reconstruction and, and have reconstruction performed for that matter too. So that's um, a very high percentage. And if, if you compare that to the Scandinavians, they'll basically only reconstruct maybe on 50. Um, so there, there's it goes, and they have very successful outcomes, which I'm sure we'll talk about with the the Cannon trial, which is very very well cited and and yeah. referenced when we start talking about non-operative literature. So there's probably some middle ground there. I, I don't think 90 to 95 percent should be the reconstruction rate, uh, and you know 50 percent. Some would argue maybe that's a bit a bit low, but look, they have successful outcomes with 50 percent of the population who um, choose to go down a non-operative route. And I think that's probably the definition too. Maybe needs to be considered as well. So conservative mm -hmm. management, I think most people would think, oh look, I'm just going to rest it. I maybe just ride an exercise bike or I might just do some straight leg straight. raises. Or I might just um, you know, do some ROM drills. Now, that's all fine and it is conservative management, but I think we need to flip how we consider what ACL injury management is. And it's actually really good quality strength and conditioning. It's, it's good quality rehab and so rehabilitation should be considered an option. Um, rehabilitation alone should be considered an option after ACL injury, not have an ACL injury and get rushed off to surgery within a month and have a reconstruction. Um, that's and then the literature will will you know tell us that's also that's a justifiable decision. Um, and it, and it probably should have longer than a month and maybe even have as many as three months. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. You mentioned the Frobel study, so the Canon trial and uh, Frobel, Frobel and colleagues obviously study. Uh, so uh, say in the last decade, the, the study mostly 
people started, researchers started comparing what if, what if we don't operate, what happens? And what we have been lacking for a long time was a uh, study, that, study that were able, would have been able to tell us how will, how will it go long term, mid long term. So um, there are many things to discuss about. Let's start from the time. So we have to give people the proper time to see if they can cope with yes. uh, a deficient, an ACL deficient knee or, or, or not. So this verb, coping, uh, now became, um, so we can categorize people in copers and non-copers. Uh, again, mm. if we look at the literature, so let's talk about this. What's a coper and what is a non-coper? Mick. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually even like probably to take it one step further, it's it's um, a potential coper because, you know, we, we may classify the person, I, I guess coping is, is proving themselves that they can cope, but when someone injures their ACL, you know, they, they sort of need to be stratified into, is this person a potential coper or are they a potential non-coper or are they a non-coper? So I, I think that's where um, there is an algorithm and the work out of Delaware um, and Delaware Oslo cohort and the work from Lynn Snyder Mackler and um, and Heggy Gringdom and, and all those, that wonderful group of researchers, they've got a wonderful algorithm that you should be encouraging people through after an ACL injury. Um, so once the knee is settled um, or quiet, one would call it, so if the range of the knee is full or almost full, if there's no quads lag and the person can actively strengthen their quads and use their quads and extend their knee, and if there's very little swelling, that's considered to be a quiet knee. Now, once they've got a quiet knee, we should be then putting them through a screening process. So the screening process is a four-step process to determine if someone's a potential coper. So you have the quiet knee, you ask them two questionnaires, you ask them to do a six meter time top test, and then you ask them if they've had any instability episodes. Now, if they if they pass those series of tests, then they're, protect, they're, they're a potential cope up and they should be encouraged into really good quality strengthening rehabilitation and neuromuscular control rehabilitation for at least five weeks some would argue we probably need to extend that out more but that would be the that would be my um best practice in encouraging someone to do that now if someone fails on one of those four tests that isn't the end of the world even <coughs> though they're classified as a non coper because we know in further follow-up studies on this COPA versus non-COPA or potential COPA versus non-potential, there are people who can, can change their coping status after rehabilitation, and as many as 50% yeah. can change from being a non-COPA to a potential COPA with as little as five weeks of twice a week strength and conditioning. Um, as per, there's a really good paper out there which is freely accessible. It was written by uh, uh, Eitzen, E. I T Z E N and colleagues, uh, 2010. It's a free PMC article. Anyone can get it, mm. um, and it details quite clearly what that protocol of exercises is. And that should be really the first step in the process that someone goes through after an ACL injury to prove to whether or not they can be a potential <laughs> coper or a true non-coper who actually probably should be encouraged into surgery because they are truly unstable. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of literature now, and it is the basic and the most important one we have to consider. And definitely the Delaware uh, Oslo study and that, that group. Um, and again, they provided us a useful way to classify the copers. And also, um, you mentioned all the criteria. I would just add, obviously, the giveaway, uh, giveaway one in terms of the Scandinavian mainly said, OK, it's never surgical. We have to see how it goes because if it doesn't give away, I mean, if the, you are able to control the knee and you feel that is a stable knee, subjectively yep. speaking, it doesn't really matter if there is an objective laxity because it, obviously there is, but you are yep. feeling it like you can control it and it's not betraying you. So it, there is not, there are no giveaways, uh, no more than one. Well, we can still go through this process and see how it goes, and that's yeah, the, the main thing, right? And the hey, other part Adam, of it, yeah. go ahead, please. Oh, go, go. I was lucky to have a really nice conversation with Dr. Adam Colvinor, um, who's an ACL um, yep. researcher and has got a very strong interest in osteoarthritis after 
uh, ACL injury and he worked in some of these um, uh, research centres in Oslo many years ago and he was describing his experience with it and he, he basically walked away from that experience saying the person really needs to prove themselves to be unstable to then warrant surgery. So basically everyone's offered uh, rehabilitation first and if they prove themselves and prove the surgeon and their physiotherapy team to be consistently unstable then have surgery but really the person needs to prove themselves to be unstable before surgery is really decided and I think that's a really nice powerful message we should be <coughs> empowering all our physiotherapists medical providers orthopedic surgeons you know like that's we, we really need to be proving the, themselves to be unstable before surgery is done so what about now let's talk a little bit about clinical practice everyday clinical practice because that's what we do um if we are lucky enough to have surgeons that refer patients to us and said okay do we have a full tear up to you now i know the literature i want you to uh put this guy through some rehab and let me know in one possibly two months as you correctly mentioned there is this eight weeks period it might also be 12 i would like to stretch it to 12 if it's possible okay. to see how people evolve because we know that up to 45 percent and you mentioned 50 percent that's anyway also or let's say grossly uh, correct percentage of non-copers who people that look like they are not able to cope with an ACL deficient knee, actually they evolve. They, they now, uh, at the beginning, they say, no, I can not control it. I don't, I don't pass the test for uh, being labeled as a coper or I feel it unstable, but they long-term, at actually mid-term in three months, uh, can cope with it. And it, so they just need time. Um, but psychologically speaking, how do you handle things at the beginning? And also because the cultural, cultural uh, settings around are, Mostly, you know, people, maybe the uh, friends of them, they just underwent surgery. So what they expect is, oh, ACL tear, I have to undergo surgery. How do you handle yeah. people that they don't know anything about the copper, non-copper copper stuff? Yeah, I, I find it to be quite a really uh, powerful consultation. I actually had one earlier on today where I, I consulted with a lady from Toronto who injured her ACL in January this year in a skiing accident. She's a late 20s, likes to dance likes to ski, likes to, you know, basically is um, in, engaged in non-risk, low-risk activities. Look, yeah, look, skiing's a little bit risky and dancing can be a bit risky depending on how vigorous you're dancing and that kind of stuff. But basically her goals are that she wants to just stay fit, stay active, go to the gym, run, exercise. Mm -hmm. And she's consulted with four or five physiotherapists and orthopedic surgeons up until now, all of whom have said, she needs to have surgery and I, I just said look how's your knee feeling she goes it feels strong like I feel okay like I've got a bit of soreness it's a bit puffy um I don't feel unstable I've had no giving way and I said well let's just keep on going and she goes really she, I said yeah wh why not you know like I, I said just keep going let's get you strong let's modify your exercises right now because you don't have a gym to go to because of coronavirus let's do some home exercises right. let's Right. Keep you getting strong with your body weight exercises. And she walked away with this empowerment to say, look, I am fit. I am strong. I, I'm, I'm not vulnerable. I'm not fragile. Like the, the messages we as clinicians can empower our patients by providing a really positive conversation about staying strong, staying active. Um, it's great. And uh, for me, it, it's really nice con conversation to have because you get a lot of people, happy, smiling faces walking away from that conversation. And I think that's where a lot, there is a lot of negativity without around <coughs> ACL. There is a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of, you have to have surgery and you have to have rehabilitation for so long and it's going to hurt. Everyone <laughs> fails to forget that the ACL reconstruction is another trauma to the knee that unsettles that environment. And that can be quite devastating to the knee <laughs> on top of the ACL injury that they've already had. So look, I, I think each person that presents to you has a choice. Um, now for this lady, her choice, absolutely. She, sh she is coping at the moment and she classifies as a coper, um, but she's not going to high risk activities where she's gonna be pivoting, cutting, twisting and turning. And these are the sports that we, we just don't know how people will go. So often the de default button is reconstruction, but those that just wanna have a regular life and run straight lines and go to the gym or do pre-planned movement exercises like dancing, gymnastics, all these <coughs> things, they, they, 
done very well on an ACL deficient knee. We just have to prove to the person that they're strong enough and stable enough. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And the thing is, most often is, uh, again, the fact that you have been the first to introduce the idea after many consultations. So let's talk about the relationships between us, physical therapists and surgeons. I think this is something we need to build. This is something very crucial because if we, I mean, it's just, it, it is just a much easier job if the surgeon refer the patient to you. And so the patient comes to you after a consultation yeah. with his or her surgeon, they already mentioned, look, we don't know. We have to see, let's go through. If you need me, I'm going to be here to reconstruct your ACL. But the yeah. expert now is the physio. Let's, let's put you through a solid, qualitative, high quality rehab, because then there is the concept of high quality rehab, or anyway, a decent quality rehab, because I would say yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we are lacking as many, as many papers uh, underlined and highlighted. Also, after reconstruction, I mean, we know worldwide there is a lot of, there are a lot of problems in terms of high quality rehab. So yeah. how do you work with surgeons? Do you reach out for them? Do you try to establish um, a relationship in advance so that you can then find yourself in an easier situation? Because that's what I do. That's what I advise yeah. everybody to do. And also to be in the OR here and then to have a solid relationship because just surgeons yeah. don't have time. So we need to sort of yeah. get no, there, I agree. And get to their place. Those are the steps that I've taken. So I moved to Melbourne about four or five years ago, and I was an unknown. And I, you know, like probably a lot of orthopedic surgeons um, don't know me in Melbourne because they're in their little bubbles. And but when I was first here for the first six months, I, I made contact with some orthopedic surgeons and watched them do work. And that's how those relationships were established. And now I've got a nice network of ten orthopedic surgeons who I can happily talk to and share ideas with. And and, and a few of which are actually very pro non-operative rehabilitation. And to me, that, that's a great quality in an orthopedic surgeon. Some, some don't, and that's fine. Um, if, that's, if they have that belief system that they must reconstruct every ACL, you're not going to change their idea. All you can hope out of that person is that they'll at least give the, give the ACL deficient athlete a good pre-op window. And that, that would be a good outcome for everyone, especially if... The person's committed to reconstruction and the surgeon won't change his mind or her mind. Um, however, I've come across probably two or three orthopedic surgeons here in Melbourne um, who are actually pro non operative um, proponents who are actually happy to help their, their patients prove themselves to be unstable, even young athletes for that, for that matter too. Um, so that's great because ultimately you're empowering the patient. And from an orthopedic surgeon's point of view, it's a really good move because if all if all goes to you know crap and the person doesn't like the way they <laughs> feel in their knee and they choose to have a reconstruction, guess who's the first surgeon they're going to go to talk to when they sure. they're not happy. So the surgeon's going to so it's a win win situation. We just need to be as clinicians be very, I guess, at the forefront of the surgeon's mind and at the very very least really uh, advocate for preoperative physio. You may not change yeah. the mind of an orthopedic surgeon um, and going non-operative. We just have to accept that. that they've got such an ingrained belief system that every ACL needs reconstruction. It is our job to try and educate them, and hopefully this discussion that we're having tonight, Sebastiana, will sure. hopefully fall on the ears of some orthopedic surgeons. But it's mm -hmm. going to be a generational shift, I think, in my opinion, yeah. for things to change. So right now, the best thing we can do is be present in the in the OR and in the emergency departments or the private rooms and, and talk to, watch the surgeries, talk to the surgeons and really, really drive home at least, at the very, very least, high quality pre-op physio um, that the person will do before their planned operation. And if we can get that person feeling so strong and confident that they actually don't turn up to their operation, <laughs> good, even good because their rehabilitation has been so good. They make you make, If we can make them so strong before their operation, then that's a really, really good thing. Because we know that benefits the person in the long run too. Yeah, exactly. That, that was what I was going to tell. You touched another solid point, and again, it's evidence-based. So we know anyway that even from the beginning, someone wants to have his reconstruction or his knee uh, with his ACL reconstructor or her ACL reconstructor, uh, up to t two years post op, a solid, good, solid pre-operative uh, rehabilitation is going to pay off because the outcome is going to be better. 
So this is something that we can, that's what I have always done. I would say sell to surgeons, tell them, listen, anyway, three months, good, solid, two, three months pre-op, send people to me because what we can do together is, um, well, if we can avoid ACL reconstruction, it's better. Anyway, it's plenty of people with ACL that needs to be reconstructed, so it's not going to affect your business in terms of how many surgery you have to perform, number one. And number two, better outcome for you. So it means that they will thank you rather than me because anyway, the surgeon is, you know, is the guy that actually reconstructed the ACL. So we all know it's another, you know, another thing it's for patients. So it's going to be better for you as a surgeon long term as well. So that's so another have very important turning up at six months really cranky that their surgery has failed or their surgery is sore you know especially if if we put the person into a really good place before their operation they're going to thank the surgeon so much so much more in the end of course they'll thank us physios for doing a great job with the rehab along the way but but i think certainly from the surgery surgical point of view yeah if they that person can be super strong with high quality rehab for at least six weeks if not three months um before the operation that would be great so now, um, again, coming back to the cultural setting, let's say, let's talk about osteoarthritis. Like, so let's talk about this uh, very, very hot topic. Um, mm. Let's say um, the most frequent comment still is uh, coming from everybody. I would say not just surgeons, but physicians as well. It's, it is really common. It's just out there. Well, but if I don't reconstruct my ACL, I'm gonna end up having OA, so osteoarthritis, yeah. mid long term, and uh, that could have been would have been true. Let's say in terms of long term data, we didn't have them up to a few years ago. But then, uh, Van Iperen and colleagues published a 20 years follow up study that is the longest we have now, and others are coming because there are many core studies that are running um, yeah. around the globe. And they, they were just basically compared in athletes. So it wasn't just regular people, but in athletes, they were comparing who, uh, so ACL reconstructed knees versus uh, deficient knees, so no surgery. And actually mm -hmm. OA was higher in terms of incidence in the operative yeah. group. 80% yeah. of them compared to, I think 68, 69, if I remember well. So yeah. I would say this is a big, big thing to comment on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the, what we're finding, certainly it's not the reconstruction, um, it's not the the treatment choice so much, that's the, the problem, it's the ACL injury itself yeah. is the catalyst um, to having OA change over time. Um, that That's that's what we can clearly see, and there's a really nice meta-analysis by Poulsen back in 2019, so last year, that had a, had a hell of a lot of people, like I think in its whole, um, cohort it had nearly a million people um, that they included in this um, this study on knee arthritic arthritic change after uh, knee injury now what they found was is that when you have an isolated ACL injury um, you have a four times greater risk of developing knee OA at least 10 years down the track now that's a pretty yep. consistent finding we'll find in a lot of different studies it's usually 10 years after the fact of the injury yeah. whether or not you have a reconstruction or not um, you'll have some degree of OA change now, where there was more arthritic change in the people long term, so after 10 years, was in those that had a meniscus injury. So the meniscus is a really big problem. You have an ACL injury and a meniscus injury, or yeah, you yeah. have to have bridement, or you have to have some cut out. That, that in itself is, is a big problem when it comes to future knee health. So those that have an ACL injury and a meniscus problem, it, you've got a 6.4 times greater chance of having knee OA change. 10 years down the track. So, um, and this is compared to uninjured knees or those that have never had an ACL injury before and a knee injury before. So it's it's quite clear that yes, ACL injury is a problem to future knee health, but the treatment choice, it doesn't matter. You know, if you have a reconstruction, it's not gonna preserve you or your no. knee knee arthritis. Conversely, if you have an ACL injury and you do rehabilitation, your chances of getting knee OA as well are, are really high as well. So it really matters in the, in the short term and the long term is that you make sure those that have an ACL injury, they really need to make a lifelong commitment to their knee. Where in those first three to six months, making sure they settle that knee down really, really nicely with high quality rehab. Now, if they have to have a reconstruction, then, then so be it. Because there may be some other mitigating factors that they, they choose to have a reconstruction. They might have had a big 
um, meniscus injury, or they might have had a big cartilage defect, or they might be a professional athlete where yeah. the decision is very the decision to return to sport and re 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 the decision to have a reconstruction is a bit more complex and complicated because of business um, sure, sure. issues. And the fact that they're a professional athlete, so there, there certainly yeah are other mitigating factors as to why people have a reconstruction, but. Those that um, have an ACL injury who maybe just need to give that knee some time, that first three to six months really, really matter. Then mm -hmm. they really need to make a lifelong commitment to their overall body health. And we know that if you put on weight, for every one kilogram of body weight you put on, it's four kilos of pressure your knee then now yeah. has to deal with. So we need to stay fit. We need to stay active and healthy <coughs> after an ACL injury, regardless of treatment choice. Um, that's a big thing because we, we want to maintain our weight and be healthy for, for years to come so our knee doesn't become symptomatic um, of knee arthritis. I think you uh, just um, uh, mentioned two very important things uh, that I would have asked you, but uh, it's nice. I mean, you anticipated the future, future questions that, uh, was, that were coming. Uh, the first one is, uh, it is we have two different scenarios, right? Two different uh, situations. Either is a isolated ACL there, so it's just the ACL, or we have other things involved, so concurrent injuries. And uh, I used to uh, say be in contact with Dr. Noyes in the US for a while, and uh, he always told us, so the ACL is not that serious injury. I mean, it is, obviously it is, but what is more serious, a meniscus injury or an ACL injury? And everybody tends to say, well, obviously ACL. And it was, no, no. I mean, if you have an ACL, isolated one injury, well, you can just reconstruct it. And it's obviously a problem. But if you don't have a meniscus and the meniscus is badly ruined, so you cannot reconstruct or you have to transplant the meniscus, long term, it is a disaster. So um, that's the scenario number one. The call mm. also comes from either it's just an ACL isolated tear or plus meniscus, plus cartilage. Mm. That's a completely different scenario. Most probably surgical. It, it depends by the, I mean, by many of the stuff, yeah. right? Exactly. And you look at the Froball study, and this is where I think there are a real, there's a, there's a small group of, I think, physiotherapists out there who are really such strong advocates for the non-operative movement and the rehabilitation line where it can be actually quite dangerous in that, not, not all ACL injuries can be managed or should be managed non-operatively for that matter. So you look at the Froebel paper, they have um, a long list of exclusion criteria um, in those AC, ACL injuries. So yeah, there was ACL, ACL injuries with some minor meniscus damage or some sure, minor sure. OA changes, but they excluded those that had full thickness um, MCL injuries, PCL injuries, full thickness cartilage loss lesions, um, repairable meniscus. Like these are significant injuries that also need to be considered when you're having a discussion with your ACL injured patient because not all ACL injuries can or, or should be managed um, non-operatively. I'd argue though in those MCL injuries where there has been a full thickness or maybe a PCL, you give that yeah. PCL or that MCL yeah, yeah, and you manage it right manage that for three months now we're still left with just an isolated acl injury so yeah um but if you have a repairable meniscus or you have a cartilage lesion there that could be fixated and, and, and fixed then that person should be given um a surgical opinion and and we should stand back and let that surgery happen because that meniscus and that cartilage is that trumps the acl each and every day yeah absolutely that's um exactly how uh, I think we all uh, run our practice every day. If it's just an isolated ACL, let's give it a try and see how it goes. But if we have other things involved and we are talking about cartilage, where, whether it's fiber cartilage, so the meniscus or the cartilage itself, it is just different. And that's, I think, where the value of being in the OR helps because, uh, and also knowing um, how a meniscus behave. I mean, it's not just, even suturing meniscus, is not, it's, it's not the same. I mean, uh, the the hoop forces and all the the way a meniscus is able to uh, absorb forces it's just compromised it changes and so it is it, it definitely uh, it's a different scenario the second thing you talked about is and the profile of the person we have in front with an ACL let's say isolated uh, lesion so whether he or she is a person regular has, has let's say uh, has a job and uh, just play some rec recreational sports, but it's not really that active. 
versus pro athletes. And then again, we have different sports. Uh, let's say pivoting sports versus uh, inline sports, right? Yeah. So uh, that is, again, used to be considered, still is considered a very different situation. But also we have some literature is coming up saying, well, even if you are playing sports with pivoting involved, uh, might be done with no ACL. Comments about mm. that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting question, particularly um, the non, uh, sorry, the elite athlete. There are case studies of elite athletes doing really well and returning back to pre-injury levels of sport without their ACL. Um, we often hear about the often cited English Premier League footballer who yeah. returned back to top flight football after nine weeks after ACL injury and played another further at least two years um, now, the interesting thing about he was, and what you'd probably maybe see in some other case studies, that they were an older athlete. So someone who had been around for a while. Now, this player was 32. And so he probably rolled the dice. And I also understand he had a World Cup to consider as well in a short period of time. So there's going to be extenuating circumstances in our elite setting about whether or not someone as, as a professional athlete will try to play their chosen sport. Here in Australia, we had a really really interesting case of a professional Aussie rules football player who was 36 and he tore his ACL in the preseason last year. Now he tried to go non-operative because it was going to be his last season and yep. in his first game back of a, of a trial match he re-injured and had an instability episode. So we have successful outcomes in the elite sure. setting, we have non-successful non uh, outcomes. So it is hard when you're in the professional environment to make that decision. And I, I applaud any future professional athlete who's maybe a bit younger, maybe in their early 20s or mid 20s, who are choosing to go down a non-operative path because there is a lot of unknown in that area. Now, you compare that to maybe someone who's non-professional choosing to go back to a pivoting sport. It's, it is hard to make that decision and, and, and hard to... Um, plan for that person because they don't have the daily physio staff assessing yeah. the knee, assessing for swelling, having the supervision. Um, it, it is a lot of a harder decision to make in the non-professional world, um, but it, it can be done. We just got to make sure that they've got a really good team of people around them. And, and as you as a physio, if you're going to advocate for this younger athlete or this middle-aged athlete to go back to basketball, football, soccer, <coughs> handball, whatever sport it may be, we've got to make sure we're available to, to help the person because yeah, we've yeah. got to be regularly contacting the person to see if their knee is coping or not. Is it swelling? Are they having instability episodes? Um, because it is, it's a 50, it's a 50, 50 chance. It's literally yeah. a toss of the coin because we know 50% do well and, and can manage non-operatively. And we know 50% will have instability episodes or further pain and, and choose to have an operation. So it is a lot harder when you don't have the daily medical environment like a professional athlete may have if you're going down the non-operative path. But it absolutely is a treatment choice that someone can do. Yeah, we have been uh, multiple cases directly treated or just that we know about in uh, winter sports. So skiers, uh, someone, I'm not going to mention name, obviously, but someone won a World Cup, was a female uh, athlete, and, and she was just skiing. And again, the scenario is quite often the one that you just depicted. So end of career, no other choices. If I undergo surgery anyway, it's going to end up my career. I don't want to do it now. So they sort of probably have uh, an extra energy, uh, say something more to put on the table. But still, anyway, it cannot be enough. I mean, sometimes it's just uh, you would have liked to do it, but it's not. Doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. So, that's um, a really interesting point you make because if you go back to that the COPA versus non COPA paper from Heard back in two thousand eight, which we sort of talked about a little bit before, mm -hmm. um, the fascinating thing about that um, algorithm is that at no stage in that paper in that ten year follow up that they did were they looking to to turn the people who who'd injured their ACL into a non operative um, patient. They end up finding that out anyway. But the whole point of doing the, the COPA algorithm was to determine whether or not if a person injured their ACL, could they get through that next season and then have an ACL reconstruction in the off-season when the time was better? And what yeah. they found was people get through the season, get through to their off-season and start feeling good and they'll just keep on playing. 
And yeah, that was yeah. a fascinating find, which was pretty cool. So much like how you've got the skiers who are tearing their ACL in competition months out before their gold medal event, let them go. Let them get strong again. Give them the opportunity. And if you know if they can step up onto the world stage with an ACL deficient knee and still participate, that's a pretty amazing feat in my in my eyes. Yeah, I would say this is the big um, in a in a lucky situation in the lucky situation in which we uh, deal with surgeons that understand what we're talking about, so they are updated and so they are open to the non-surgical option. This is still the sort of the kind of people in which they are more reluctant in terms of now anyway, uh, pivoting, I mean, the forces of the, on the knee, they're not just, it's just too much, can, can be done. And, uh, and so it's when uh, the athletes can play a role, but obviously, I mean, if he or she is strongly for an option, non-operative option, uh, this can be the case, and if that's what happened in our practice, for example, in which it can be proven to the surgeon as well yeah. that it can be done. But obviously, there are no guarantees for the future in other cases, but yeah. yeah. Uh, the other th Go one ahead. more little case study. We had a professional rugby league player. I'm not sure if your listeners or viewers know rugby league very much. It's basically American football without the pads. Yeah. And um, <laughs> here in Australia, we had a, a case of a, a 30, he was about mid 30s. He actually played and he'd had two previous, I think maybe even three previous ACL reconstructions on, on his knees. At some point in his last two to three years of his career, one of his grafts had failed and he didn't even know. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't picked up until one day late in his career, maybe a few weeks before he was set to retire and finish career anyway. He just had a routine MRI on, on his knee and they said, Oh, your your graft has failed. And he'd been playing for the last, you know, two years on an ACL deficient knee. Um, so it, you know, absolute professional athlete in a high risk sport and he, he did well without an ACL deficient with an ACL deficient knee for a long time. Yeah, there is, a, there is exactly the same case in, that has been in NFL, uh, can tell more, but it happened the, the very same. The guy was so strong probably and so, I mean, muscle-wise and uh, the structure it was so good in terms of uh, coping. I think he underwent for sure two uh, reconstruction on the same knee, pretty sure mm -hmm. I would, probably not three, but two for sure. And the same thing happened, end of career, uh, but it was three years after, three years after the last surgical reconstruction, three or four, he had a car accident yeah. actually. And the car accident yeah. didn't involve the knee at all and somehow got an MRI because of the bruise, whatever, he had a, some hematoma. It was just a, out, uh, an extra articular and they said, well, there is no graft there, but this is not new. This is, I mean, there's nothing there. So it has been there like this for a while, probably. Yeah. And the guy just did never, never yeah. complained. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so last couple of things, I would say uh, three questions, actually two, and then we will go a little bit through the guide that you guys developed in the, in, in, uh, the yeah. Melbourne ACL uh, guide that, that we translate in Italian is now available for free. So number one, what are the pillars? Let's say um, through the rehabilitation, what is the, you put guys, you put accent on, you make put accent on when you are rehabbing an ACL deficient knee, for example, whatever. I mean, we look a lot about the, we care about the hemis, the hamstring strength, because we want to, you know, they play their same sort of same similar role to the ACL or what else? Yeah, my, for me, the most important muscle to a short term and long term outcome of the knee are your quads. They're, they're going to shock absorb. They're going to make the knee happy and healthy. They're going to help you decelerate. They're going to help you uh, pivot and control those rotational forces a little bit at the knee and and buffer some of those loads. They're really single most important muscle when it comes to ACL rehabilitation, either treatment, um, either non-operative or uh, ACL reconstruction, followed very closely by hamstrings, followed very closely by glutes and by, and by the calf. Now, depends on what harvest, if you are having a reconstruction, then your second most important muscle then becomes the harvest tissue. So if you have a, a hamstring, then obviously hamstring is very, very important. Um, the other thing that's really, really important, which is often overlooked, is plyometric and landing ability. Like they're my two key pillars. Get your quad strong, followed by your hemis, glutes and calves. Then absolutely, we must, 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 must teach that person how to jump, land, and, and absorb load and then also to then teach them how to spring because that's 
yeah, those really important properties are going to help them rehabilitate their knee, but also get them back to high performance again. So this leads actually to the last question uh, is return to sport. Um, mm. So that's what I'm working a lot on. But if we make a parallelism with uh, surgically reconstructed knees, we don't really know how to test them. Again, let's let's talk about the literature. There is no co- such thing as a consensus for return to sport or return to play. Let's label as okay. we want. We have different publications. We have test bat- batteries. But what do we do with ACL deficient knees? Because for us, it's the same. If you have to cope with that low, we, you have to withstand uh, the load that that specific sport is going to, you know, ask you, you're, you're being, you have to go through that. Either you have a reconstructed knee, an extractor, reconstructed ACL or not. Anyway, you have to yeah. pass the same tests. So for us, it is the very same. How do you handle yeah. this? Yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's no different. If you have an ACL deficient knee and you want to go back to football, soccer, basketball, wh- whatever sport it may be, or if you just want to go and, you know, muck around in a gym or do CrossFit or do whatever you, you must um you must pass criteria you, you have to have good quad symmetry um so to be within 10 percent of your uninjured limb and for both your quads and your hamstring you need to be within 10 percent of your other other limb and you need to pass um hop tests um like any other acl return to sport test battery after a reconstruction but you also need to be psychologically ready as well so i'd, I'd also be assessing the person with the a acl rsi on top of strength tests and hop tests and making sure they complete at least two weeks, if not four weeks of unrestricted training yeah. in their team environment, because nothing can simulate the, the demands of sport like training and training sometimes doesn't even come close. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so how, exactly. How good your coach is, how much your teammates are, because the training you do is the next best thing, next best thing outside of the gym. You get strong, you train specific for your sport, and then you play. But you, I think for most people, they don't train enough prior to being cleared to play their yeah. first game. And my recommendations are train for at least a month unrestricted, get used to the movement patterns, get moved to get used to the p- cutting, pivoting, twisting, turning. Because the reality is in training, you can you can you can ease back a little bit, you can cut yourself short a bit if you don't yeah. feel hundred percent hundred percent confident. When you play for competition points, you've got an angry coach yelling at you from the sidelines. You've got opponents who are trying to take you out. You know, there's no hiding. So you need to be prepared for your sport by training. And at least a month is really important. Yeah. And also the people that are playing with you, if they, I mean, they play with you in the same team, they know you underwent surgery. So they somehow in training pro- probably yeah. protect you a little bit. So okay. this is tricky. And uh and that, that was a point in relation to return to sport uh, as should be practiced and it's it's done in the best places and that's what we strive to do. I know you do the same, Mick. That is don't leave the player, just don't don't test the player for return to sport at the end like a new thing. Oh, let's jump now. I mean, it's actually a process. We have been doing this so many times that for you, it must be just the, you know, oh, again, same things. I mean, it is not a new thing. Testing, jumping uh, with pivoting, rotating in fatigue state. So something that is ecologically valid, that is close to what you have to do on the pitch should have been, I mean, a strong part of the last month of the rehab, let's say the last three months after a surgery. Or, yeah, same for yes. ACL deficient knees. So now let's have a quick look. I'm going to share my screen. And if you want to introduce briefly, um, we translated, we cooperated in the translation in Italian of your uh, great uh, ACL guide is actually the second version of it. Um, so let me just uh, share the screen. Uh, there we are. Okay. And here we are. This is the okay. The Melbourne ACL guide, uh, rehabilitation guide. You want to say something, make about this? This is already the Italian version of it. So might be yeah, might look great to you, but. <laughs> It was a great, it was a great collaboration, and I appreciate all your time and your efforts going into this with your your team, Sebastiano. So this was a, a labour of love from uh, Randall and myself. I can't take all the glory. Randall is certainly the um, he's the brain, the brains trust behind the original version, and then I came along a couple of years ago and we brought it up to 2018 standard with some new new tests and new up-to-date research and information to extend on his already existing Melbourne ACL rehab guide from 2013. So yeah, you're scrolling through it. It's a five-stage process. Um, 
including well excluding a, a pre-operative stage so we we've made it um we've got a pre-operative um stage in there um to encourage uh clinicians to assess the person preoperatively um, because we know there's some vital and very valuable information we can gather uh, preoperatively. And then you've got uh, post-op, then you've got strength and neuromuscular training, you've got return to agility, jumping and landing, you've got uh, return to sport and then maintenance. Okay, so you've got a five-stage process there um plus the um the post the sorry the pre-op phase and and each step of the each step of the guide is a criteria driven process where you don't pass from one phase to the next until you've uh finished all the hurdle requirements from the previous phase so um we're, we're moving away from a, a time-based criteria where you know in years gone by you had an operation you're running a at three months you're training at six months and you're back at sport by yeah. 12 months now a lot of people don't have that luxury of passing through rehabilitation like that e each person will go through their rehab at different rates and different time frames so <laughs> that's what we um, aim to deliver there with the melbourne acl rehab guide is some, some guidance about where you should be prior to running prior to training prior to sport um so ho hopefully your uh, your your listeners and other clinicians out there see the guide as a really valuable resource and hopefully they uh find it very informative <laughs> yeah that i just wanted to point it out that it was um uh, translated by uh luca castelli Raldo Maglia, and myself and and yeah the, the main thing i'm gonna now come back to us um okay we're yep. back uh and the the target was uh the, the thing that you brilliantly uh highlighted with that and again it is a not a time driven process it is as we all know it's a criteria based process so we have to go through um goals people have to be able to cope with uh, progressive goals to actually proceed and go ahead so me yep. um it's already 45 minutes so i think it has been a, a nice conversation with you thank you for joining us um i hope that people will enjoy this conversation uh again the nova talk are mainly thought to be not about clean strictly about clinical uh clinical topics but acl deficient knee is one of the rehabilitation is one of those in which we are there are a lot of discussions around so Mick, yep. thank you very much for joining us and joining us today uh this will be subtitled and diffused online. welcome mate no worries at all We'll uh, okay. talk to you again soon. Okay. So, everybody, thank you for joining and watching this video. And uh, that was a Nova Talk with uh, Mick Hughes. And goodbye. Thank you. See you next time. All right. Thank you, Sebastian.